have two different things to help the patients and education is very important. It's not just about great vision. Providing great provision is one thing, but we want to provide a great experience for the patient. Possibility for smoothing the core. I think this is a one of the major advantages. We try to optimize the time of the patients and try to monitor their feedback. And I think uh, patient satisfaction is the most critical for me. That's fantastic. Angie, I can tell you, your patients will be extremely happy. It is a perfect procedure, so well done. That's Epithelium is the mirror of stromal smoothness. We have been amazed by the chance to measure the epithelium regularity. When we smooth on the irregular stroma uh, after the epithelial heals, we definitely have more regular cornea. I think it's very important to have your patient with you here because, you know, that's a one-time surgery in life. We have great minds here designing a treatment based on the data that we're assessing. There is a motivation for patients, and when there is more patients, it will be good reference for others. With the actual length measurement, it designs a three-dimensional model of each eye it evaluates. The technology develops more and we can obtain more uh, precision, uh, better results. This is changing the game a bit and uh, refractive surgery is now well admitted. I think we all know that we're not just aiming at 2020 anymore. We're aiming for the best possible vision. And this is the promise that we're holding, we're working on today uh, with our patients. Welcome, welcome everyone. Welcome to the second Virtual Refractive Summit, Asian Pacific edition. We are so happy, so proud to have this opportunity. And we want to tell you that we have a lot of surprise today and it's gonna be for sure an incredible, incredible meeting. So we're gonna start, we started with the video, it was a resume of the first virtual refractive summit, but now we have a lot of surprises and we want to share with all of you. So let me put my video and we're gonna start very fast. Okay, uh, here. Well, let me tell you before we start, what is Oftamo University, our platform? Uh, we have an, we are an ophthalmological ecosystem that gives you the space to develop your abilities and skills to the fullest. If you go to ophthalmouniversity.com, you will find podcasts, courses, webinars like this one, all the needs to start the path to professional excellence today. We have three bases one here in Argentina, where I'm right now in Córdoba, then our headquarter and the Oftalmo University campus in Mexico City, and we just have opened a new base in Barcelona and Spain. So I want to say hello to my partners in Mexico, Dr. Ivo Ferreira. How are you, Ivo? How are you guys? We're doing great. 5.30 a.m. here for us, but so happy to be to, with colleagues from all over the planet. Thank you so much, Ivo. We know it's very early in Mexico City. And thank you. Thank you for being here with us. Lisandro Carnielli, Dr. Lisandro in Barcelona. A little bit Hi, later. Everyone. Thank you so much. How, how are you? And I'm really excited to be here with all these great colleagues. So thank you. Awesome, guys. Thank you so much. So... <clears throat> Industry and Academy working together. We are very happy with our partnership with the Alcon Experience Academy we, in Ophthalmo University. We truly believe uh, we have to work together in order to bring the best educational content possible. So we want to thank a lot of people. Uh, Shaming Levitsky, a special thank to Robbie Palmer who made this possible and for our great May Sung who is here with us. Hello, May. Thank you for being here. Hello. Hello. Hi, everyone. A very warm welcome to all of you. I'm May Soon, Asia Pacific Regional Refractive Business Lead for Elcon. I'm happy to present to you today and the next three Thursday, our collaboration with Oftomo University. Elcon is committed to supporting refractive surgeons across the globe through educational programs 
on alconexperienceacademy.com. And also this series of reflective um, events in partnership with uh, Ophthalmo University. So today we have the privilege of inviting our speakers, Dr. Ambrosio, Professor Wang, Dr. Ryu, and Dr. Praveen to share about looking at the new normal in refractive surgery after COVID. So thanks very much for committing your valuable time to this program. Please enjoy the session. Thank you so much, man. It's a pleasure to have, uh, to have you on board. You're such a professional team and it's, it's an honor for us to have you all. Thank you, thank you so much. So we have a, we have a little um, survey. If you can go to menti.com guys, you will find this short survey and it would be great if you can answer to help us to, to our discussion. So go to menti.com and put the code 8181-4217. It's three minutes, we take three, just three minutes. And then after this introduction and after the mastermind, the masterclass, we're gonna have a discussion about it. But let, let, me, let me tell you a little bit more about this uh, incredible summit. This is an online summit, of course, and that we have special design uh, to enhance the experience, the knowledge and the practice in refractive surgery. We have the first one in June, for Europe and now for the Asian Pacific uh, region. So at the beginning with the Alcon Experience Academy, we, we were talking about the reach our potential and we really did it. But now it's time to lift as you climb. But what is the meaning of lift as you climb? Well, on our way to the summit, we must lift and support our peers because we all want to rise our practice together. So we're gonna leave more experiences, we're gonna have more knowledge, and of course, we're gonna have a 360 surgery experience. It's gonna be a great surprise that we are preparing for all of you guys. So lift as you climb means collaboration with our peers, contribution to the development, and of course, the expansion of our potential. Talking about contribution, we have uh, the APAC ambassadors. We are working with a great group of young and well-known surgeons. And we are growing our community and they are gonna be here with us today and for the next four, three webisodes. Uh, this is very important for the young people. If you are part of the APAO Young Society or Association, you, you will have uh, scholarships, free scholarship for you. You just have to be part of these four events. And at the final of the last webisode, we're gonna have a giveaway and you can be one of the winners. So if you wanna be here, look at this amazing place. If you wanna be here with us in Mexico City, you just have to be uh, in the four webisode and you will be participating. So invite your colleagues and be part of this amazing event. Uh, our summit has its own, its own uh, community in Instagram. So if you take a picture of this uh, QR code, you can go directly to the Instagram account and you will be updated about all the activities around the world that we have. I want to thank the Media Mice guys. Thank you guys for your support. And before we start it, again, let's go to menti.com. Please help us. We want to know your opinion. We, you know, we want to know your uh, experience about these questions. 81814217. And now we're ready to present our dream team for tonight. We're very happy. This is uh, for us. We're proud to have all these amazing uh, key opinion leaders. It's gonna be a great, great night for us. Uh, from Brazil, the current president of the International Refractive Surgery Society, Dr. Renato Ambrosio. Good morning, Renato in Brazil. Thanks for being here. Good morning, Andreas. Good to be here. Welcome all. Good morning in the, the evening in the, the Western part of the world. Thank you so much, Renato. Renato, it's part of the Tango University. It's always supporting us. So thank you so much for that. But for the very first time, we have a Professor 
Wang Seng from China. He's the director of Wansu Ayer Eye Hospital. Dr. Professor Wang Seng, thank you so much for being here. Great. Uh, thank you for having me here. So this is a great honor, and I'm very happy to be part of the, the summit. And this is the first time, and I, I really look forward to this uh, wonderful meeting. Thank you so much. Thank you, Doctor, for your time. Thank you so much. From India, Dr. Professor Pravin Badavali, I, I hope to say uh, in a correct way your name, Professor. Thank you so much for being here. He's part of the Cornea and Ontario Experiment Department of Prasad High Institute. Hello, Pravin. Thank you so much. Hey, thanks, Andres, and uh, thanks for having me on. It's a great pleasure to uh, participate. Looks like you've got people from all over the world. Thanks to May for facilitating this, and I'm sure you're going to have a wonderful session. Alessandro as well. Thank you, Professor. I'm from South Korea, also for the very first time with us here in Oftam University. It's a honor to introduce Dr. Aik Hee Ryu. He's a co-chief director of the D and V Eye Clinic in Seoul. Professor Ike, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, thank you for the invitation. And it's an honor to be a part of the Virtual Refractive Summit from Ophthalmo University. And I hope that we all enjoy uh, this uh, occasion, whether it is morning or evening or night. Thank you so much. Uh, well, guys, let's have fun. It's going to be an incredible hour. We have a lot of people. We have a lot of content and we want a relaxing discussion. This is a French meeting. So be part of this. You can use the chat. We have Chinese translation, live translation. We are in, on YouTube right now live. So you can enjoy this meeting in different platforms. So Renato, Professor Ambrosio, whenever you want, we are ready for your master class. Thank you very much, Andreas. It's again an honor to participate and uh, congratulations for putting together such a wonderful meeting. Uh, we have learned to use the Zoom since uh, we started the pandemic, but your meeting is one of the highlights of the abilities to, to use this platform so well. And uh, my topic is beyond 2020 refractive surgery after the COVID-19, these are my financial disclosures. And it's important also to, to welcome you all to the ISRS, International Society of Refractive Surgery, the, the society that I am the current president, but it's been a, a, an honor to participate with the ISRS since I was a resident in the late 90s. And I also have a colleagues from the brain. We completed 10 years last year and uh, we, the Brazilian Artificial Intelligence Networking in Medicine, and we started a master class on multimodal imaging, which has over 20 hours of classes on, on the ability for diagnosis and refractive surgery. I may start with a quote, a humble quote that I try to interpret from Socrates that we need to know more. And it resonates perfectly with the mindset of a refractive surgeon. We had the 2020 year as the year of ophthalmology that we were expecting. And then we had the pandemic of the COVID-19. It created for all the humanity in this planet challenges and opportunities. One of the things that I had as a personal challenge is to go inside and revisit some old concepts and things that I really liked since I was a teenager, which was philosophy. And I came back to look at the stoicism. And one of the things that I take for granted is that the only wealth which we keep forever is the wealth that we give away. So we have to teach, we have to share, and we share so that we can gain more. And the power of our minds is really what we uh, made our uh, society and ourselves the evolving always. And it, it really is important. And the challenge for the refractive surgeon, in my view, is that we have to always learn the ways to learn how to teach. Because if we learn the ways to teach, we incorporate the knowledge and it brings, brings to be part of us so that we can even evolve with it. So when we think about the understanding of refractive surgery, you have to understand diseases. And as a personal challenge, the Valid June campaign, which I started 
a few years ago, the 2020 year will be like a very, very important year, but uh, it was not, you know, the, the violent June was, uh, in 2020 was just another month, but we were able to use the opportunity to, to, to even make a better campaign with the virtual world. And medicine and ophthalmology learn many things and are keep, keep learning with the challenge of the virus that still is not over. We can get these opportunities for refractive surgery because of the mask, for example. The mask can cause dry eye. We have the very nice uh, mask-associated dry eye. Uh, that, and also the masks are really bad with, with glasses. As a press biopic, I can tell you that I feel that all the time. So people would be more interested in having laser vision correction, refractive surgery, and we have to understand what is refractive surgery, maybe a revisiting, because we have customization, as we, we see in the other summits, we have the opportunity to do corneal surgery, laser vision correction on the LASIK platforms, myop surface ablation, we have fake IOLs and cataract surgery, which is the most important refractive opportunity that we have for helping the patient. We have also refractive therapeutic procedures with cross-linking and other procedures on the cornea, like corneal rings for treating patients with keratoconus and other diseases. Patient education, though, is important. Refractive surgery should be seen as a subspecialty of ophthalmology today, but eventually I think we have room to make refractive surgery a true specialty in medicine. You have to be an ophthalmologist for being a refractive surgeon, of course, but as a separate specialty. We deal with elective procedures for aiming refractive correction, but the goal is not a plain away front. The goal is patient satisfaction quality of vision and quality of life are fundamental. And I look at this uh, three steps. As technology evolves, we need to be keen to use the technology with knowledge and also care. Care is fundamental and care is telling people about the surgery, about the truth of the, what they should know for making a conscious decision, why and how to do the procedure, risk, benefit, limitations. And I love this quote from William Osler, which uh, goes into the basic foundation of medicine because we have a science of uncertainty and the art of probability. So we need to explain to the patient about the procedure, about risks, benefits, and limitations. And last year, we finalized a master in the University uh, uh, of the Federal University of the state of Rio de Janeiro, where I am a professor when Dr. Tiago Gladeira did a very nice work putting a questionnaire online. And you'll be astonished to, to see that a good percentage of people would say yes to the sentence, refractive surgery is 100% warranty. There is no risk. We need to teach people about risks. And we need to understand how to manage this. And we manage this with philosophy and with knowledge. I like this wisdom from the art of war in which we have to know ourselves and know the enemy. And eventually the what we are trying to achieve is optimized planning. How we do the procedure on the cornea inside the eye. Is this a refractive elective procedure or therapeutic? How we do the surgery on the cornea was the best possible outcome that we will have to prevent complications. And many of these complications can be overcome. How understanding the patient better and multimodal corneal imaging for refractive surgery is the way to do it. Of course, lens staging should be understood. The refractive cataract surgery is the most important opportunity we have as a refractive surgeon. And we need to be very keen to understand where the patient needs in this staging procedure, the mild loss of quality of vision, and we need documentation with objective shine fluke. We have wavefront and we have other tests that do document the need for cataract surgery. I like this patient, a female with 2030, she's doing well. She has a little bit of, you've seen the retroillumination, some spikes, and also she has some gluteal, which is documented based on this posterior reflection on the shine flow imaging. Interestingly, this is correlated to gluteal, and she also has some mild keratoconus. So all this dynamical propedeutical that we can do can help you to see that the patient needs surgery. And I would say 
considering the endothelium to be relatively weak, we should do as soon as possible. And considering this data, we can optimize the planning for an IOL that is not going to uh, divide light, for example, like an aspheric IOL would be the best for this patient. We also have therapeutic refractive surgery that is not aiming to rehabilitate uncorrected vision, but rehabilitate the corrected vision. So the goal is different. The outcome is going to be different. And you have to understand the difference, like we have to understand the difference between a lion and a cat, even though they share 95% of the DNA. So I come with another example, this 13 years old soccer player. He has keratoconus in the left eye, but the right eye is pretty much normal 2015, and this patient has the ability to, to show us how important it is to go beyond, not over the topography. For example, the, the right eye, we can document from fruits or susceptible cornea for keratoconus based on the tomography and biomechanical integration. However, the left eye, if you see, there is no need for going beyond the surface to detect the keratoconus. But if you see the very weak cornea, this patient, not only because of age, has high risk for progression. And I told him, let's do cross-linking, but he decided to come back and he comes back six months later. And six months later, you see K-max has even decreased. However, if you open here, the subtraction map, you see there is a stiffening here, even though K-max has decreased. And if you look at the nice work from Michael Bellin on the ABCD progression display, you see progression. There is no question this need to do surgery for the cross-linking. Also, we can see patients with both eyes having normal topographies and the TBI will be abnormal. And this is a twin, twin sister, identical twin sister, which also has some genetic in the understanding of the, of the weakening of the coin, like a susceptibility. So we go beyond, beyond, but not over. We are always evolving. We know that recent studies on the TBI demonstrated lower accuracy, for example, for detecting keratoconus. But uh, this quote is really important. We know that we have to be keen to evolve. We know sometimes that we think we are right, but you don't know that we are wrong. It's really important. And the understanding of the revolution and evolution of artificial intelligence with more data, we can train a better system for detecting keratoconus. And this is the TBI version 2, which is coming soon, in which we improve the sensitivity for this very asymmetric fellow eyes with normal topographies. So the toolbox that I have is to understand how the cornea is weak and how the cornea can afford laser vision correction in terms of the weakening, laser vision correction on the surface weakens more, much less than smile, which weakens less than LASIK. And of course, if the patient has too uh, high correction and the cornea should not afford this correction, we can go for the fake KOLs and this is the refractive toolbox that we have today. So going beyond, we have opportunities, we have challenges, the concept of the A2I squared, which is artificial intelligence and ancient philosophy intelligence applied. We need to apply it. If you know everything and you don't apply, there is not a big benefit for you. You have to apply and apply, apply, apply. Individualized medicine is the future and refractive surgery goes with the patient education and humanized medicine on the medical mission of helping the patient in the comfort zone uh, less than healing always. So we have to understand the need for patient education. And with that, I summarize with a thank you and telling you that this year we, we had a dream of putting the, the, the Jesus Christ monument here in Rio de Janeiro purple for the Violet June campaign. Thank you very much for kind of attention and look forward to great discussions in this very nice meeting. Thank you. Thank you so much, Renato. Amazing, wonderful. Congratulations for your Violet June. We saw the that image and it's powerful, really. So one of the main concepts that you have in, in your, your incredible masterclass is the patient education. So I would like to ask to the other panelists, what about this concept? How important is the patient education in refractive surgery? Dr. Ike, what is your opinion about it? Uh, comparing the knowledge of patients uh, might have, uh, 
between 10 years ago and now, they are more open to the uh, uh, information and knowledge through the internet. And as you all know and all feel the same way, the information through the internet might be wrong and even uh, uh, wrong conception can be delivered to the patients. So uh, more of need for uh, physicians uh, like us, ophthalmologists, should educate uh, patients more uh, often and thorough and should give more confidence before in, uh, go on pump into the refractive surgery. So I think that the, uh, as the Ronaldo uh, mentioned, the patient education is very crucial before uh, having all kinds of procedure for their eyes to correct the refractive surgery because it's an elective one. It, it doesn't need to be done uh, in, in, in quick way or even too aggressively. We have to talk to patients what is the aim for their refractive surgery and what the result might be with the specific method that have been chosen and also what should be done in a after surgery should be discussed before surgery to had the to don't have them to have a honeymoon period for for everlasting they should see the actual uh, phenomenon and facts before surgery i think that's important absolutely we have to struggle with dr google right guys so uh professor one saying what is your opinion you have such a amazing experience you have a volume surgeon. What about it? How to talk with our patients when sometimes we don't have a lot of time, right? Yes, I, 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 I totally agree with the, uh, Dr. Ruiz's uh, 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 opinion that uh, patient education is more and more important because uh, nowadays our patients serve a lot. They have a lot of information from the internet but this information is not necessarily correct, sometimes uh, wrong, sometimes. Um, so we, we need uh, more um, correct um, and uh, uh, to, to provide them uh, the, 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 the right information. So patient education is, uh, I think, is, should be considered part of the, the refractive surgery itself. So this is not, not only, reflex surgery is not only the, the technical part, but also a patient communication. So that, that, that's a very important, and this is more and more important in nowadays. So. Thank you. Thank you, thank Professor. You. <clears throat> Dr. Vallavali, you are in India. You are in a well-known institute, a worldwide institute. What is your opinion about this concept? Well, uh, I, I really liked uh, Renato's talk, and uh, one of the quotes in his talk uh, was about uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, and he said that uh, you should know just enough to know that you're right, but if you know too much, then you know you'll be wrong, and that is exactly what I think you should treat your patient. Sometimes uh, too much information is a bad thing, and sometimes you just need to tell the patient as much as they need to know. Uh, I, I, I always believe that with patients, it is about building trust and it is not about giving all the information that is available out there to them because they do not know how to handle it. So once you build a relationship and you build trust, then I think you cater to what they want. Some patients are happy with just knowing that you know that the surgery is correct for them. Some patients don't trust you and they want to know everything. So I strongly believe that sometimes it's not just about knowing what patient to operate, but I think in refractive surgery especially is knowing which patients not to operate. And I think that probably makes all the difference. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Pravin. Renato, uh, your opinion, your, your master class is incredible. We have so many concepts. Uh, you are working, um, but we can say boutique, uh, kind of practice, right? Because you are a solo practice. And I can imagine that it's very different when you talk with your patient, you have time, you, you tell me more about your experience with all your patients. No, Andres, it's a challenge because in Brazil, the economy is not in the best shape as possible as in Argentina. But yeah. I think 
we have to 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 be in the mindset of aiming to do the best as possible always. And um, I try to do individualized treatments for every patient. And sometimes it's a challenge because uh, the the ability for the payment that the patient has is sometimes the opposite of the need for the specialized care. And eventually we have to be keen on how to handle these patients because as, as a doctor, before even being an ophthalmologist and a refractive surgeon, I want to help people. That's, that's what motivates me since I was a medical student. So uh, in this situation of, of having to profit because we have the payrolls, we have all the, all, all the, all the responsibilities as, as a family man and as, a, as an entrepreneur, we have to, to consider the best way of making the, 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 the ball roll. But we have to focus on the patient and try to do the best as possible. And eventually, we have to see that ourselves as a, as a doctor, as a surgeon, we need to have help. So divide and conquer has never been so well mentioned to me because we need to, to have people that on the management, they would help us to, to be free to focus on what we do and what we want. So uh, I, I, I'm, I'm really moving now from a small practice to a larger group uh, with, with this type of, of, of things in mind so that I have my, my business freedom so that I can focus on what I really like, really love, and I really can do best as possible. Excellent. Ivo, Ivo, you have a, a comment. Yes. Uh, first of all, I just can't pass by Renato's uh, quote about to always learn the ways to learn how to teach. Renato, I think that's so powerful. And that's something we live by in Ophthalmo University, not only to teach our, our patients, but also our colleagues. Amazing quote. Thank you for that. Uh, and I wanted to say three things. The first thing when we communicate with our patients is the language, right? And since we have colleagues from all over the world, I think we need to use a specific language for them to understand what we're trying to say, right? The value proposition. And I would like to know about this amazing panel about that language. The, thing, the second thing is the experience because the patient comes to understand the experience they're going to have, right? They're going to lay down. How long is it going to be? Is it going to be a cold room? Is it going to be painful? Are they going to have some smell or something, right? I think that experience is so important. And this, the third thing is about the outcomes, right? Because everybody comes for an outcome, whether we like it or not. And we need to manage expectations, so in some way, we need to be even a psychologist, right? I think that's the, the three pillars of, of that communication. Absolutely, Ivo. And, and before we move on with the Professor Wan Sen presentation, let me show you one of the questions in the survey. What do you consider to, bet, to be the most determining factor for the refractive surgery patient? And our colleagues vote for results. That's the main factor right, for the patient. Then the excellent experience, third, the surgeon, and the last one was the price. So I think this is a good news for us, right? Well, uh, Professor Wan Sen, this is your time. Whenever you want, you, you can share your screen and let's see your amazing okay. work. All right. Uh, uh, what I'd like to share with the, uh, with the audience is that that the, the some interesting results that uh, from the big data analysis that re recently released by the IRI group. And this analysis was based on the electronic uh, records from higher hospitals from 200 <laughs> cities across China. And uh, this data set included um, more than a million eyes which received refractive surgeries uh, <clears throat> during the past three years from 2018 to 2020. Now, if we look at the uh, age distribution of our patients, we'll find that this, the Chinese market is very different from that of the rest part of the world. 
for example, uh, our, the patients, our age, uh, uh, <clears throat> Range from eight uh, from seventeen to seventy nine, with an average of twenty five point three years. The average age of our patients is much younger than that, say, in the U.S., which is about uh, thirty seven years according to the market scope. And uh, I, I think the, the the reason for this is a quite a part a large number of our patients are high school graduates who want to join the military or trying to be more competitive and seeking better school or job opportunities. And although the um, 20 to 24 was the top one age group, and more than 14% of our patients are under the age of 20. So this is a very, I think it's very unique. And also interestingly, that only 3.1% of our patients are over 40. And this number in the US, according to the market scope again, is 26, 26%, which is uh, more than eight times higher. So this is, is a very interesting, uh, I, I think this is a, a, a very unique uh, picture of the Chinese market. And also this is a big blue ocean market in the future and could be a driving force for the future growth. So, and if we look at the, 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 the chart on the right, it shows the di different uh, surgery types, distribution among the different age groups. And we can see that the LASIK is still the mainstream across the board. And ICL is more common in the uh, patients over 25, but smile is more common in the younger age groups. So this is a, a, this is a very interesting fact. And if we look at the, the gender distribution, this is also very interesting. And in younger patients, uh, younger than 24, we can see uh, more male patients I think the reason is the maybe uh, during this uh, in this group there are more students and military personnel, and uh, in patients groups over twenty five we can see more female patients, and the motive of this for surgery in these age groups are trying to be more um, uh, better looking. Um, better lifestyle or, or more self-confidence or something like that. So, and it, interestingly, there are more female patients uh, in the eye cell groups. That is to say, females accept the eye cell surgery more than the male patients. And we also compare the uh, results of different procedures. You can see that all the procedures are very stable in terms of refractive regressions over time. The apparent more regression in the ICL groups is probably due to the fact that uh, uh, the, the, the relative, relatively unstable refractive status at the time of surgery in this relatively high myopic patients. But the data also shows that the smile surgery recovers slower than uh, LASIK and eye cell do. And for example, on day one after surgery, only about 77% of the smile eyes had uncorrected visual acuity equal or better than the pre-op corrected visual acuity. But this percentage is about 20, about 60, about 85% in the LASIK and as high as 87% in the ICL eyes. But of course, this difference disappeared at one month after surgery and at all the post-op uh, visits afterwards. So those are some very interesting facts that we, we have uh, from this uh, uh, big data set. We're still working on the data 
uh, database and digging um, the data and trying to find out more interesting and more uh, some scientific uh, results from that, this analysis. So that's a very um, brief sharing of my analysis. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Wang Sen. It's incredible to have one million eyes data. What do you think, Dr. Barabali? It's a lot of, a great number, right? I guess, I guess if you really want to have a predictive model that is built from your data, I was just thinking that this would be an amazing AI model that you could share with the rest of the world to predict outcomes of surgery. Yeah, fantastic data. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have a lot of work to do. Uh, so, yes, you, you, I, I agree. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for the advice. <laughs> mm. uh, Renato, Ike, we just saw that LASIK keep doing or keep being the one of the favorite technique, right? Yeah, LASIK is, is a magic word. And uh, as our friends in the Refractive Surgery Alliance, then Dury, a very prolific uh, refractive surgeon in the US, he says, words matter. So I think when I see LASIK dominating, uh, I think we should consider working in terms of how to how to educate people about it. And, and, and again, education, promotion, seduction are not the same. So for example, in Dan Rennstein's clinic, he calls myo keyhole LASIK. And eventually we should be keen on how to use these words because LASIK is the, is the word that people have in their minds. ICL is, is a very great product, has evolved tremendously. All the work that Zaldivar has done and many others, but we have other fake KOLs in the posterior chamber. They eventually have some newer materials and that have learned and they, they really go upon the shoulders of the work that the, the ICL has done. So we have the ICRIL fake, for example, and others to come that eventually should call posterior fake KOLs. And not to mention that uh, probably in, in, in China, it's not so popular, but the artisan lens is still uh, been used very widely in Europe, for example. So, and, and again, we have to find the best procedure according to the patient's characteristics. So individualized treatment is not only to customize with Contura or any, any other fancy newer technology that we have, but individualized, customized is based on a broad of what the patient needs and the characteristics of the eye, not only even the cornea. Thank you, Renato. Before we start with the evidence toolkit section, Dr. Ike, some comments about the amazing presentation of Dr. Wang Seng. Yeah, uh, it's uh, kind of similar, but uh, some differences stays in South Korea compared to the China, where we do see a lot of smile uh, comparing to the LASIK surgery. And because we were dominated by PRK in prior decade. So LASIK is the minor procedure compared to the PRK surgery. So uh, because uh, patients were uh, tired of having PRK surgery in very slow uh, recovery manner. So they were seeking for a little bit more faster recovery uh, and want to achieve their goal as soon as possible. So in, in between market, the smile strategy uh, uh, came into in very perfect position and uh, the small portion of LASIK surgery and a lot of PRK had been converted into smile surgery. So in Korea, the situation, situation is a little bit different from China right now. And I still believe that LASIK and even PRK stays very valuable method for the refractive surgery because the lenticular removal technology uh, doesn't offer customizing way of ablation. So many eyes are different uh, from what we called normal. So uh, some of the patients need to be treated in customized way. And that's customizing pattern uh, only offered by LASIK or PRK 
and even with the, the Alcom platform or other uh, companies' platform. So I think the most valuable uh, uh, aspect of the laser refractive surgery, including the LASIK and PRK, is we can touch the patient in customized way. I think that's a good tip. Agree, 100%. Thank you so much, Ike. And I want to remind to the audience, next uh, Thursday, we are going to be talking about techniques and then customized surgery. So you can miss it. Ivo, you have a comment before. Uh, I just have a, a very quick question for Dr. Seng that has so many eyes. Dr. Seng, are you seeing a pattern of people who want to be with good vision next day, you know, LASIK kind of thing, or a patient that you will understand uh, more safety with a PRK and spend one week, you know, with some issues, but they prefer safety? Of, co of course, the safety is always the number one concern of patients, but um, if everything, every other things are comparable, and um, people prefer to recover fair, faster. And, and, the, um, and as I mentioned in the, uh, earlier, that the majority, or not majority, a very large portion of our patients, especially the young patients, are people going to um, military or finding better jobs, and they want of even faster recovery. So this is a, 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 a good selling point for, for these procedures. And they care about this uh, more than other people do. So although this is not the, uh, the most important part of the people's consideration, well, uh, picking uh, uh, procedures, but this is one of their major concerns. Yeah. <clears throat> Well, Jason, we're ready for your section. This is one of our favorite section. Jason, uh, do a great job with this uh, topic. So my friend, it's your time. Hey, thank you for a kind of words. How are you guys doing today? Um, we're gonna talk about the evidence toolkit. And when we talk about the evidence toolkit, the goal is to give you some tools for you to improve in your daily practice. Um, I'm going to start with a few questions for, for some of my colleagues, and then we're going to get into the topic. So um, I wanted to ask Dr. Sen, how do you identify what gives your patients the most value at your, uh, at your current practice? Well, as a uh, refractive surgeon, this is a, always that we are trying our best to provide our patients the best results uh, uh, to meet their expectations or some, so even exceed what they expect from their surgery. So, so I think this is the, the value that we, um, uh, we give our patient is to, to use the, the latest, uh, not, not necessarily the latest, the best technology that we have to, 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 uh, to, um, to provide them the best results. <sighs> Also, the patient's uh, expectation is growing and their demands are also growing with time. So we have to, to try our best to, to meet them. So this is a very challenging Excellent. as well as exciting uh, part of our career. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. So you ask patients what their expectations are and then you exceed them. Fantastic. Um, Dr. Vazavali, what are some of the key indicators that you monitor at your clinic? maybe on a daily basis or on a per month basis? Well, uh, if you want to monitor numbers, it's easier to look at uh, footfalls of patients who are coming in without appointments. And that actually is a good indicator of people who are wanting to walk into your practice. But one of the most important things that I do, and uh, this is not something that you can put a number to, is I always ask a patient who comes into the clinic for the first time, where did they find out? How did they come here? If I hear a lot of them say that they came in from a reference, a relative, a friend of them had, had, had surgery here, and that's why they told us to come, that is a great sign. So I think that is very important. That's a, thank you very much. Um, Dr. Ryu, how do you identify what made your practice different from the competition around you? 
Yeah, I, I very emphasize two things to my staffs and also our doctors who are working in our clinic. One is professionalism. And second is the customer experience. Uh, professionalism not only includes the knowledge that doctors or staffs should have, but also uh, the, as Ronaldo Res mentioned before in this session, we have to select which one should not have the refractory surgery. So that covers very important aspect of our doctor's role to eliminate the candidate uh, of the refractive surgery who has already has some disease or even have a risk of, of having disease uh, with the refractive surgery. So that's the one of the knowledge that you should have. And also be conservative. The uh, most updated procedure or method is not always the right or best solution for the patients. So surgeons and doctors and also staff should be more conservative in backed up with the data and also the experiences to offer patients most safe and effective uh, methods for refractive surgery. So that's the one prof professionalism that I call. And second thing is the customer experience. We should stand as customer to uh, uh, change or even set some systematic uh, pathway or even some of the rules and some of the uh, method in our clinic in terms of customers Spect of view, not the staff, staff's view. So we have to find out what the true uh, customers' demands are uh, required for us. So we have to understand the customers' uh, uh, needs and we should uh, deal with that. Then that will be the some of the practice difference stre uh, strength that we might have compared to other, other clinics. Excellent. So, so, sorry, Jason, I'm sorry. Before we yes. move on, let me show you guys what our colleagues were answering about that question. What made your practice different from the competition? And the most important answer was, was quality, technology, compassion, uh, knowledge. I can see ethical, user experience, compassion, outcomes. It's very interesting because... These are the thoughts of our colleagues from all over the world. So I think it's, it's very important to have these thoughts also. Yeah, uh, thank you, excellent, Andres. So uh, as you can see, a lot of what we do is dependent on, on the formation that we have. And what I would like to talk to you guys about for a little bit, if I can get my screen to share. Um, and that is, can you confirm? Can you guys see my screen right Perfect. now? Perfect. Yeah. Yes. Excellent. Thank you. So what I want to do is to give you a few toolkits or a few tools to see how you can use data to tweak your workflow and in that way reach your um, reach the summit to to continue to climb. Um, so when we talk about finding what our workflow is, when we talk about finding um, how we can do. Um, how we can do better continuously with all of our patients, we need to talk about these three concepts. We need to measure everything. We need to add value to the things that we do. And then we need to um, relentlessly eliminate waste. So first, let's talk about um, measuring everything. When you want to measure everything, you have to measure from the top to the bottom. And then you set data-driven goals. And then you want to find a method to climb from the bottom up. What does this mean? It means that if you have a goal of having um, um, X amount of time for your patients, then you need to figure out how much time is taken for you to get there. Let me give you a, a, a little example from a, a, a clinic. So after you identify what the value producing um, actions in your clinic are, and you create a, a value map, you can measure the time spent with no value, uh, with no added value, this would be the time that is spent waiting by patients. And you can also measure how often a task is successful for the first time quality. The way this looks at a particular clinic is that you identify the parts of your, uh, of your daily consultation that actually make um, value or produce something of work for your patient. This could be, um, in this case, the check-in, the, the, 
technician work of the physician exam and the checkout process, just to simplify yeah. things a, a little bit. Jason, I'm sorry, your yes. slides are not moving. Moving on. I was afraid of that. Um, no worries. It happens all second. the time. You know, it always happens live during the first presentation for some reason. Absolutely. So, perfect. So let me... Can you guys see me now? Yep. Yep. Okay. So let me just give you a quick um, view again. You measure from the top down. You set goals from the bottom up. You create a value map and you measure both patient value time and the first time quality. And that's what we're going to do now. So um, when you are creating a value map, this is how it looks. You have the value producing steps, which are the check and the tech workout, the physician exam and the checkout process. You measure the, the, the times or of, of the steps that don't create any value. These are waiting times, the triangles are waiting times. You measure what time the patient is spending. So that's what you see here with patient time is one minute for a second. And this is successful 95% of the times on the first try. So that's um, the first time quality. You mentioned once again, patient time and how, how often this procedure is done perfectly well without any interruptions on your first try. You add what the total patient time is, and that's how you know how much time your patient is spending at your clinic. Then you add what the total patient value time is, and that's what, how much time the, the patient spends in things that actually produce value to them. When you divide both, you get what the value added time is. And this is how much percent of the time your patient is actually getting something out of his visit. You multiply all the percentages of the first time, of the first time quality. And that's how you get a measure of how much your, what your quality as a clinic is. When you have these numbers, you understand how much time a patient is spending at your time and how much of that time is actually valuable to the patient. And if you want to improve, once again, you set data-driven goals, measuring from top to bottom, and then you find a method to climb. So what you're going to want to do is to add value to everything that you do. So you look at areas of opportunity, which in this case are the times that they're waiting, and you either shorten the waiting time or add value to this waiting time. By doing that, you're going to improve what your total patient value time is and the percentage, the value added percentage is going to increase as well. Sometimes you have to do this in a more granular way. And you do that by taking uh, specific steps of your consult. For instance, um, here we're looking at the physician exam. And in the physician exam, once again, you have the patient, the physician will greet the patient, it will take the history and the chief complaint, um, then they'll do a, a split lamp exam. But in between these steps, they, they can, you know, he st stops to study records, wash his hands, disinfects areas. All these interruptions are things that you have to identify, protocolize, standardize. And once you have that, you can create um, cycles of continuous improvement where you define what your problem is, you measure what you're doing, you find ways of improving it and you improve, uh, you sustain that improvement with change leadership where you value this sense throughout your institution. And that's how you continue to add value to what your patients are doing. And finally, wasting nothing, wasting nothing uh, means identifying the key areas of waste in our practice. And when it comes to ophthalmology, the five most important areas of waste are waiting either by the physician or the patient, inventory, which means that things are not where they need to be. They might be um, out of reach. They might be too much where it doesn't need to be, or it might take too long to actually get it to where you need it to be. Um, transportation, how much time do you spend moving from one place to another? To, do, to get things done. Human talent. Sometimes you have people that are overqualified for what they're doing or that are underqualified and not good enough at what they're doing. So finding the right place for every single person in your practice, for every single person in your practice is important. Overproduction, which means that sometimes certain steps of your, of your pathway are producing too much things and create bottlenecks that, that will uh, reduce the efficiency of other places. So once again, how do you tweak your workflow to reach the summit? You measure everything, 
you add value and you waste nothing. If you want to learn more, there's a fantastic resource um, available from the AAO that is called Mastering the Art of, of the Lean Climate Practice. And I want to rem remind you to lift as you climb. Um, in order to do that, we can connect. And these are some of the areas of interest that, that I have. Um, that's all I have for today, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. As always, your presentation are amazing. Ivo, I know you have some comments from the public, from the audience. Uh, and I know very well that you love this about measure everything. You are obsessed with that, right? Completely. I mean, you, you just can't improve what you don't measure. And this is something we know for, for far away, right? But but we, we, we resist that. I, I was talking with Thomas Campbell, um, an amazing colleague from Australia, and he was telling us that that people try, you know, colleagues try to do this, but it's not easy. So I would like to, to know, you know, the opinion of Dr. Sang, Dr. Ambrosio, and the other members of the panel about this. You need to measure what's going on, right? Well, if, if I may, I, I think we have to be humble to always improve. Uh, you know, we, we want to have our practices to be the best as possible, to be the state of the art. And we go to the meetings, we learn, and we try to implement things the best way as possible. But you, you just shown very nicely that we have opportunities to improve since the greeting up to the checkout. And I would say even after the patient is, is, is out of the clinic, we have a post-consultation and everything can be, can be continually improving. So, uh, and I, I really like the, the idea of measuring putting metrics, objective metrics, make you uh, be able to understand objectively what's going on and how you can improve. And if you don't measure, you can evolve. Perfect. Excellent. Ike, Pravin, uh, Dr. Juan, some, do you have some comments about it? I think, uh, I mean, very nice perspective from the point of view of uh, trying to use a, 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 a direction towards improvement. And I think it not just improves your practice, but also improves you as a person because it gives you more time as well. So I think a fantastic way of, uh, and your entire team, what is more valuable than time for your team? Nothing else. So I think fantastic way of thinking. And I think uh, what, what we've measured is also uh, more at, from the point of view of the output. We don't measure uh, ophthalmology parameters as much, but more patient satisfaction parameters, uh, regular surveys, patient feedback, and then try to act on that because I think that is where value really lies. Excellent, excellent. Guys? Yeah, this is a very, very nice talk. Uh, very educational. Uh, yeah, this is a an objective and a systemic a systematic way of improving, especially important for us uh, high volume centers to increase patient satisfaction. And this is a very nice tool. Thank you so much, Jason. Gladly. Well, uh, we're finishing. Ike. Would you like to add something else about this incredible presentation of Jason? No, no, no. Much of the comments were done by other panelists, and uh, I'm much uh, uh, have very big insight in the but not the Dr. Ambrosio's comment on uh, we can do more after they leave the clinic. So not only the waiting time receptionist uh, uh, customer satisfaction or even our physical exams and doctors uh, uh, friendly approach to patients are important but uh, even they left the clinic the the mobiles internet and uh, a telephone uh, numerous types of contact points can be delivered to patients to get more education and get more satisfaction so uh, we uh, not only emphasize on what we should do in clinic, but think more widely to offer some of the uh, customer satisfaction methodology after they leave the clinic. 
I think that's important. Um, and so as, if like, if yes, I may, I, I like to add something. It's I'll, easy I'll, to to miss the forest for the trees and just think about the numbers and forget that we are dealing with patients. Um, and it's important in this that as we measure, we also value time um, that we give to patients in order to actually make them feel like they were seen. Um, it's, it's not enough to just um, cut your time short. You also need to make sure that while you're doing that, the patient feels like he's been tended to and feels seen. Um, so I, I really appreciate what my colleagues have been mentioning about listening to the patient and giving value to the patient and, 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 and creating more time because the, the better you are, the more efficient you are, um, it's easier for you to find places where you can actually add that personal human touch to, to your consult. Thanks, Jason. Um, before we finish in, uh, because we want to be very respectful with the time, we were talking about 60 or 75 minutes maximum. We want to show you guys what is going to be in the next web results. We're going to have an all 360 experience. For all our audience, you will have uh, access to this website where you will have different uh, 360 experience from our campus. And I know, Ivo, you're here. Uh, tell, tell us more about this experience. Meanwhile, I'm sure you, I will show you a video of what is this about 360 surgery. Take a look of this, please. Yes, uh, I don't, want, uh, yeah, I don't sorry, want the sorry. panel. I don't want the panel to get a little bit scary. You know, we love the cornea, and these guys are doing <laughs> something in the retina. Don't worry about that. <laughs> this is just to show you what's going to happen next Thursday. As you can see there, we are going to have a 360 experience that you can do from your cell phone, from your computer, and even if you want to be there with us, if you have an Oculus you're gonna be there with us, I, I can trust me on that. Basically what we're gonna have is we're gonna have the entire experience of being inside a refractive suite. You can see me there also in another video with the refractive suite. We have a campus here in Mexico City and the suite it's 100% dedicated to teach. I'm gonna go back to Renato's uh, quote about to always learn the ways to learn how to teach. And this is basically what we wanna do here. We want you next Thursday to be there with us because it, it, I'm a cataract surgeon, I have to be honest. And I, I, I'm beginning to do some refractive surgery. And sometimes I don't know which pedal is the correct one, how to move the joystick from the right eye to the left eye, how I'm gonna grab you know, the patient head, what I'm gonna say to the patient in that specific moment how the, you know, the bed is going to turn from the femtolaser to the eczema. I think in that experience, if we surround ourselves with experts, we're going to learn basic steps, but also the tricks and the tips from the expert to have an amazing experience for the patient. So we're going to be waiting for you guys uh, next Thursday. We're going to be with the refractive suite and it's going to be an amazing experience for you. Absolutely. Don't be scared. This is retina surgery. We are not going to be doing something like this. It's going to be everything about refractive surgery. We wanted to show you how is the experience, as you can saw, just you could be inside the OR in the headquarters of Tom University a campus. So it's going to be amazing. Well, we're finishing. Uh, we have some questions of the public, of the audience. Um, let me see. There are some questions for you guys before we, yes. Evo. There, there is one about, uh, and I would like to ask uh, the panel yeah. about presbyopia correcting uh, surgery in, in refractive, in a refractive surgery. Are you doing that Renato, Dr. Seng? Well, I am struggling with my own presbyopia now, but <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, I do, refer, uh, you know, laser vision correction for presbyopia with mini monovision has been around since my fellowship. In the late 90s, I was doing partial mono, as Steve Wilson called, leaving half of the optomyopia. Uh, the, the, the challenge is the, the 
and, and we do well for the myopic and hyperopic even better. But again, expectation is key. But the, the, the challenge is the plane of press biope. That's exactly me. 49 years old. I'm 2015 uncorrected uh, for distance. And I have just plus a half and minus a half as a refractive area. And I, and I do well with multifocal. So uh, I'm still thinking what's the best way of doing my surgery. Uh, blended vision, you know, enhanced monovision, however you want to call. I, I don't like presbylasic. Uh, the name, again, words matter. Uh, we, we have to be very, very careful on expectations. But I am really dreaming with the holy grail of refractive surgery to restore accommodation. And I think it's possibly coming. We had the Camera, and I have even my eyes done by my friend and colleague from Italy, Luca Gualdi. Uh, he has an electric simulation of the ciliary body, which worked for a couple of weeks, but we need to do more. And But unfortunately, the company has done uh, not much than the early. He got the medal, um, awarding medal award on the JRS paper a few years ago. But I think femtolaser for lentotomy, however, may be a opportunity for the future. But we, we, we have still this as a challenge to educate patients that they will need glasses for reading, at, at least for some situations. And eventually, it's not something we have perfectly as we have for distance vision correction in a young patient. Thank you, Renato. Thank you so much for your thoughts. Okay, we're finishing. We want to give you the last words for all of you guys. We want to thank, thank you so much for your time. We know very well that you are so busy. The audience is so happy with your uh, thoughts, your presentation. And of course, we are so happy also. So Dr. Wan Seng, thank you so much once more time for your presence. It's a honor for us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Vadavali, thank you so much. I know you are in the OR. Thank you for uh, being here and, and make this possible. Thanks, Andres, and thanks, Ivo. Uh, I think should say that this is not topics that are traditionally covered at most refractive meetings, but this is of such great value that you guys have thought about what really is going to help. Thank you so much for bringing this up. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your kind words. Ike, Dr. Ryu, thank you so much in South Korea. It's very uh, late over there, so thank you for being here. Thank you. I just want to yeah. say Helen. that we, we all have T-shirts. The, the, the moment we see Renato and Wang and Pravin and Dr. Ike, we're going to have T-shirts for you guys. Absolutely. As soon as we see each other. Okay. And for me, too. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you, you okay. OU, as well, for waking up so early you know, in the morning to do okay. this for us. Really appreciate it. Renato, thank you so much. You are always supporting us and we, we really appreciate that. Congratulations. Great work. Education. We teach. We learn all the time. That's great. Congratulations. Good to be okay. here. Yes. Before we, we, we say goodbye, let me show you uh, very quick the panelists for the next week. It's going to be amazing also. Uh, it's right here. Uh, one second. Uh, here, look at this, another dream team. We're going to talk about techniques and the big fives, the best clinical tips and the application for your practice. And we're going to be doing live surgery, simulate surgery from our campus. So it's going to be amazing. Don't miss it next Thursday, same time. Thank you guys. See you next week. Yeah. See you.